I said, Ray, you know, if I've ever said anything that offended you or hurt you, So, with that in mind, uh, that most important meeting, Ellen might actually said, uh, in the summer of 1888, August, she wrote to the, the conference brother and said, you know, the most important meeting ever to occur Oops, is uh, coming up in 1888. I believe Ellen White foresaw what was coming. She said you should pray like the disciples did on the day of Pentecost which I, I think Illinois knew. The Lord is getting ready to send the latter rain. So I want to just share some quotes here. And this is why I believe Raymond was such a staunch supporter of Jones and Wagner. He didn't base it just on his own feelings. He had support for what he believed. So I want to just share some, some of these statements. This is what Ellen White uh, wrote about that 1888 meeting, it was actually the first time she heard them speak, and she says, speaking specifically of Wagner, she said, when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas, and she's talking about the matchless charms of Christ in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard, and then notice what she puts in there, accepting the conversations between myself and my husband. What she's referring to is that before James White died in, in uh, 1881, he had a reconversion experience, and it was on the subject of righteousness by faith. And they would stay up late at night talking over these things. And a conviction was coming that they needed, they were both going to go to California, and they needed to start writing on these topics. And for uh, whatever reason there in the summer of uh, 1880 or 81, James White said, you know, he couldn't leave Battle Creek. He'd been a part of starting the work. He couldn't just leave it to see it fall by the wayside, uh, not realizing, you know, God is, was still in charge. Yeah. He said, he, I would rather die than leave. And three weeks later, he passed away. But Illinois says that while she sat by her dying husband holding his hand, God promised her that he would raise up others to give that same emphasis and message. And in 1890, she referred to the message of Jones and Wagner as a fulfillment of that promise. Then she says, and when I present when they presented it, every fiber of her heart said amen. That one statement alone, I think 
should uh, cause us to, to pause, you know, if we question that. And sadly, many in our church question that. And I've heard this on both, you know, many, both camps. We have the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, or we have the Bible, we don't need anything more. But I don't think Illinois supported that. This is what N.T. Nash said. He was there, and some 60 years later, this is what he said. From Mrs. White's attitude and words at that time, it was plain she stood 100% with Jones and Wagner in the message they were presenting at the General Conference meeting. And that's actually what caused so much doubt and criticism of Illinois was because she was supporting this message. There's some places where she calls it new light. There's other places where she said, this isn't new. It's not, you know, some new message. It's been in the Bible. It's old life in a new, old light in a new setting. Amen. But either way, it was new to many of the brethren and they uh, rose up against it as, as we're all aware. Uh, on the last day that she actually talked at Minneapolis, she made this comment about, um, if now if the, this is the last meeting, if the ministers will not receive the light, I want to give the people a chance. Perhaps they will receive it. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, it started in Battle Creek, actually, uh, uh, and there was some response there. And then from there, they went to uh, South Lancaster. And I wish we had time to go through this. If you've never read some of the revivals or the reports of the revivals, it, it will bring life to your soul. The interesting thing to me is that many of these revivals happened on college campuses among the young people. Yeah. Thank you, dear sister. Everyone remember that's my cup. <laughs> and from there, Chicago, uh, Kansas, many places, 1889 and 1890. And during this time, I, I'm just going to read some more, a few more quotes here that Ellen White said about this message. She said, I would have humility of mind and be willing to be instructed as a child. Now, this is the this is Ellen White herself saying this. The Lord has been pleased to give me great light, yet I know that he leads other minds and opens to them the mysteries of his word. And I want to receive every ray of light that God shall send me, though it should come through the humblest of his servants. So Ellen White was, was willing to listen to Jones and Wagner and to herself be blessed by that and to speak side by side. And again, 1889, she made this kind of a comment. We have traveled, speaking of Jones and Wagner, and there were others that joined. Uh, we have traveled to different places of the meetings that I might stand side by side with the messengers of God. And I knew that I knew were his messengers. And I knew had a message for his people. I gave my message with them right in harmony with the very message they were bearing. What did we see? And this is the part I think they gripped Raymond all the time. We saw power attending that message. And I tell you, those days aren't over. They're not over. And there at South Lancaster, the mighty movings of the Spirit of God were there, and every student in the college was brought to the door there in confession and the movings of the Spirit of God were there. And thus from place to place, everywhere we went, we saw the movings of the Spirit of God. And this is what's so interesting is so many times, it, in fact every time, it brought confession and, and uh, change in people's lives. This wasn't just some shallow, um, you know, raise your hand and, and live as you please. This brought change in people's lives. And again, on college campuses. Another statement, this is uh, from 1890. I have traveled from place to place, attending meetings where the message of the righteousness of Christ was preached. And that was 
part of that message. And more recently, uh, uh, and I talked to Dale about this, I've come to see that, you know, so often in all these places, including the revivals at South Lancaster on the college, Jones was preaching about religious liberty and righteousness by faith, side by side. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally feel that I have missed that part and not really realized, I mean, I knew Jones was always talking about religious liberty, but I have not realized that those two together you know, bring power as well. Mm -hmm. I consider it a privilege, says Ellen White, to stand by the side of my brethren and give my testimony with the message for the time. And I saw that the power of God attended the message wherever it was spoken. The people confessed their sins, appropriated the righteousness of Christ. God has set his hand to do this work. Everywhere the message led to confession of sin and the putting away of iniquity. And again, you cannot separate it. When this message was preached, it brought change in people's lives. Um, another one. This is uh, 1890 as well. God has sent men to bring us the truth, and notice how she says this, that we should not have had unless God sent somebody to bring it to us. Big words. So here's the prophetess saying this in 1890. And again, I've heard people say today, well, what, we have the Bible in Ellen White, we don't need anything more. She was willing to stand and say, this message would not have come if God didn't send it, somebody with this message. I'm not suggesting that Ellen White knew nothing of righteousness by faith. She had taught it for years before 1888, but God intended to, and I can't remember what word you use, to um, refine it or to bring it to the, to the forefront. And, but some of the gripe, I think, with Joseph Wagner is their, their message was a message of repentance. And uh, here, uh, to Uriah Smith, Ellen White, in 1892, still trying to get Uriah Smith to turn from his... his uh, fighting against the message. She says, the message given us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. Yeah. The Laodicean message has been sounding. Take this message in all its phases and sound it forth to the people wherever providence opens the way. And then notice how she applies this. Justification by faith and the righteousness of Christ are the themes to be presented to a perishing world. The latest in message, by the way, doesn't stop with the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's to transform a church to then take that same message to the world. And within the same week, or about two weeks after she wrote that, she wrote this uh, unpublished letter, so many of us have not read this, to S. N. Haskell, speaking again of, of Jones and Wagner in regard to the Laodicean message, and she says this, the self-satisfied Laodiceans have shut out, have shut Jesus out. Worldliness, self-righteousness, pride, lukewarmness have so long bound the soul in chains of unbelief that now when the Savior's voice is heard through his messenger, Rebellion and stubbornness of soul are added to deepen the guilt. Clad in their worthless garments of self-righteousness, they feel insulted when told they are naked. Again, notice, the Savior's voice is heard. Behold, through my delegated messengers, I stand at the door and knock. And I wonder today in the Adventist church if God still intends that the message that he sent through them 130 years ago is still meant to be that messenger knocking at the door of our hearts today. Amen. So just a few summary quotes here. The Lord has raised up Brother Joseph Wagner to proclaim a message to the world. To prepare a people to stand in the day of God. Men who were chosen to give the message which the people needed in these last days. And I think it's still relevant today. The very men whom God has entrusted with a message 
for his people. Well, I'm going to jump ahead here a little bit. 1892, another very interesting letter that Ellen White wrote to uh, Essen Haskell. Ellen White already was in Australia. She'd been exiled there. And on April 6, and you need to remember this, this date, April 6, 1892, this is one of the earliest places I've found where Ellen White refers to the loud cry beginning. So she's writing to Haskell, and I'm just going to read a few paragraphs out of this letter. It's really only about a page and a half long, the, the entire letter. And most of this, or almost in its entirety, was unpublished until 2015 when the White Estate, you know, opened up or allowed all of these letters to be uh, accessible to everyone. And this is what Ellen White says to Essen Haskell. She says, what more can I say? My heart is filled to overflowing. Only those who, fit, who are fit for this work, who are imbued with the Holy Spirit. The light has come. The light which will enlighten the whole earth with its bright rays has been shining from the throne of God. Now, what, what verse is she quoting from or, or referencing there, the, the phrase that she's, she's using there? Revelation 18. Exactly. Yes. Shall we fail to appreciate the most precious privileges that are brought within our reach? Shall we go on in our own weakness? Shall we walk in the sparks of our own then she says, Brother Haskell, I present this to you, that you may present it to others. Oh, that the Lord would convict and convert souls, that the light now shining may not be removed from us, because we do not walk in the light and lead others out of darkness. I don't think she's suggesting that God would abandon the church, but light that's not uh, appreciated can be removed. I feel intensely over this deadness and frivolity. And then she continues, she says, I tell you, God is testing us, April 6, 1892, just now. The whole earth is to be lightened with the glory of God. The light is shining now, and how hard it is for proud hearts to accept Jesus as their personal Savior. And then she closes, those who have not accepted this offering will not understand anything of the light which fills the whole earth with its glory. So in the same letter, at least three times, Ellen White quotes, you know, or uses phrases from Revelation 18.1, and six times she uses the word now to describe that it's beginning to shine. April 6, 1892. And S.N. Haskell actually, based on Ellen White's request, wrote six articles in the review based on that letter and uh, they were published in the review in the summer of 1892. Wonderful articles. Uh, that, and that's actually how I ran across that statement um, uh, the first time was actually reading Haskell's article. Well, that summer, and I'm just going to kind of scan through this as I close, some of the most uh, amazing revivals took place at Adventist camp meetings, summer of 1892. And I tell you, if you ever get a chance to, you know, go to the GC archives and open up those uh, review, entire review, and you can read some of the reports of people talking about the revivals that summer in 1892. And I'm just sharing just, you know, little sentences out of some of these reports. But, but there's a theme here. Notice, this is a report on Minneapolis, Minnesota, and notice how they, they start this. This was the largest camp meeting ever held in Minnesota on account of the large outpouring of the Spirit of God. And, uh, and then, of course, they give details of what was taking place there. Uh, Non-Adventists coming to the camp meetings, accepting Christ, people that have been members for years, finding a new re uh, relationship with Jesus Christ and the change that was taking place. A uh, report on uh, North Indianapolis, Indiana. This meeting was the largest camp meeting ever held by our people in the state of Indiana. This is all happening in the summer of 1892. Cleveland, Ohio. This was the largest meeting ever held by Seventh-day Adventists in the state. Missouri. 
This was the largest gathering of Seventh-day Adventists ever held in the Missouri Conference. And then it goes on to describe what was happening, including in, in this place, the last sentence there, quite a number were healed of physical afflictions, some very marked cases of this kind occurred. So it wasn't just spiritual healing. There were people that were receiving healing from physical uh, problems as well. Virginia, we had the largest number in attendance that has ever assembled in this conference. So something truly was happening summer of 1892 during these revivals. Lincoln, Nebraska, it was the largest meeting of Seventh-day Adventists ever held in the state of Nebraska. Now, so when you read through this, it's like you can't just pass over them without saying, okay, what was something was going on? And this is in the day, by the way, there was only 30,000 Seventh-day Adventists around the world. Lansing, Michigan. Of course, this was more at the heart of the work, and this one's article starts by, this meeting was the largest ever held by Seventh-day Adventists period. It is probably safe to say that no such gathering of Sabbath keepers has taken place for centuries. So, so there was uh, well over 3,000 uh, people there, and they weren't even counting the children. Uh, Jones, Prescott, Carlos, and O.A. Olson, the conference president, was there, and the, the topics were religious liberty, Bible study, righteousness by faith, and on the last meeting there, the last night, um, on Sunday evening, I guess it wasn't the last night, but it was the last evening, and then they had meetings on Monday as well. Several things happened. The brother Miller uh, had been one that had been at Minneapolis, and he had a lot of antagonism towards A.T. Jones. And during that meeting on Sunday evening, he, the, the Holy Spirit got a hold of him. And uh, he got up and he confessed that uh, Ellen White had written to him and rebuked him for his attitude and so forth, and that he had been ignoring that, and he was going. He wanted to acknowledge that, and so he did. And then he sat back down. And within a few moments, um, the Holy Spirit let him know he wasn't. It wasn't. He wasn't done. There was more. And so he stood up, and this time in front of several thousand. People, and this is a conference worker, he, he turns to A.T. Jones in front of this whole audience and he confesses his personal issue that he has had with Jones and he asks for his forgiveness in front of this audience. Amen. It was like fire in the stubble or as some describe it, like a tidal wave or a wave. And all of a sudden, all over this whole congregation, people began to stand up and, and wanted to share a testimony, wanted to say something. And so this was all unplanned. About 20 to 30 ministers then went out in this huge congregation and in little groups, they had a time of sharing and testimony and confession time. By the way, I should go back. Uh, Elder Loughborough says that he had seen nothing like it since 1844. Mm -hmm. This is how Loughborough himself described it. He said, the mighty power of the Lord was there in a marked degree than I have ever seen since the time I attended the Appen meetings in 83, uh, I mean in 43 and 44. That was during the midnight cry. By the way, all I said that the latter rain was going to come but it would be ten times the power of the midnight cry. <clears throat> we felt truly that the times of refreshing were beginning to come from the presence of the Lord and that we were having a few drops of the latter rain. Mm -hmm. The camp meeting closed on the evening of October 2 with a praise service, the like of which I never saw before. This is Loughborough. While the voice of thanksgiving and praise was attending to the Lord, or ascending to the Lord, wave after wave of His Spirit bore witness of heaven's approval, and so our people parted to go to their homes. 
You know, I've always thought of a tidal wave as a destructive thing, and it, and it is. And Ellen White described the Holy Spirit being poured out in these events as a tidal wave. But not for bad, but for good, to destroy sin and all that comes with it and to bring new life. And that's really what was happening. This is what uh, Ian uh, Pebbles, I think that's how you pronounce her name. She, was, uh, she wrote for the review uh, several articles over the, this time period. She was very poetic and eloquent and she was there and this is how she described it. Had, had a large article that's worth reading. And she says, with wonders we look about us, glad to see the same joy shining from the countenance of others that we feel in our own hearts and we say to ourselves, what can it be? It is a little shower of the latter rain. A little foretaste of the refreshing that is soon to come from the presence of the Lord. And we wonder if there was, has been a meeting like this since Pentecost. And we try to think what God has still in store for his people. And that was the result of attending this, this meeting, these meetings at, um, in Lansing, Michigan late 1892. Now this is Oye Olson. I'm just going to scan through several of his letters. He was there and he witnessed this and he couldn't stop talking about it. Everybody he wrote to, he had to tell them about this meeting. We had some droppings of the latter rain, he says to S. N. Haskell, writing to him. In the afternoon there was no less than 50 on their feet to speak and between 20 and 30 were speaking at once. Talking about that meeting. It may seem as though there would be a great deal of confusion, but that was not the case. While many were speaking, yet it sounded as one voice of praise and glory to God for his wonderful love and salvation in Jesus Christ. He writes to Ellen White, even telling her about the experience. He said, the Lord has blessed us remarkably in this meeting. It has gone far ahead of anything I ever saw in Michigan or in another place before. We had our parting meeting Sunday evening, and after the preaching service, there were probably nearly 2,000 people at that meeting. I never attended such a meeting before, and I and never before saw such manifestations of the Lord's power. There was, and then notice, there was no excitement. Now that's interesting that he would say that. I'm not saying there. Were, I don't think he was saying there was no emotion, but this was not a fanatical, excitement-driven movement. Amen. This was the Holy Spirit working. And the reason I bring that out is because that today it is written in book after book that we sell in our ABCs that claims that these revivals were all excitement. Oh. But. I, I take the word of the primary source for the Amen. Finishing up, uh, Oye Olson writes to A.J. Breed. We had the most excellent meeting at Lansing. It was the largest ever held by our people, and it was perhaps the best, all things considered. Some of the workers in the 1844 movement said that the experience of this meeting were similar to those in the Advent movement in 1844. Surely, we had sprinklings of the latter rain. This is what God was doing. This is what he was up to. Again, he's writing to L. Johnson. I did seem, it did seem to me that we had at this meeting some of the droppings of the latter rain. Some of those who had longest been laboring in the cause said that that meeting put in, them in mind of the meetings of 1844 movement. Surely God is blessing his people and we may look for greater strides in our work than ever seen in a given time in the past. Then he writes to Wagner, who's in England. I never was in a meeting where the power of God was so manifest, yet there was no excitement. And I, and I think you have to understand in the context of what he's saying. There were people praising the Lord for freedom and for newfound faith in God. Again, he writes to D.T. Robinson, I am glad to be able to say that I, it has been by far the best camp meeting season that we have heard, had. The last camp meeting that I attended was in Michigan, and I have never before witnessed the power of God present in so great a measure. It is very evident, Brother Robinson, that the message is rising. 
and that we shall soon see the truth go with mighty power. There are many things transpiring that indicate that we are on the verge of the message going with a loud cry. This is, by the way, October 17, 1892. And on November 22, this is the first time Ellen White, I guess, publicly in print, made it unequivocally clear that the loud cry had begun. Past tense. The time of test is just before us. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. 